You're listening to Cards to the Moon, a podcast about trading cards from both a collector and investor perspective. We hope you'll stick around for the ride as we take a deep dive into the state of the hobby, share some hot takes, hopefully some useful advice and fun stories along the way. Hey, welcome back to Cards to the Moon. This is episode 176, and it is your Friday edition of the pod. My name is Clark from 5cardguys.com and 5cardguys on Instagram. With me co-hosting as usual is Hyung of Integrity Sports Card. And John is away again this week for this episode, but he will be back with us uh, next week. All right, off the top today, I recently posted on my IG account. I don't know if you saw Hyung, but... I posted on uh, the Five Card Guys IG account as well as our podcast account, which is at Cards to the Moon, all one word. So please follow us there for some additional hobby content. But what I posted was the first five sales of the MLB debut patch, one of one autograph cards that we've talked about on the pod that everyone's talking about these days. Um, And those sales have ranged from $2,000 being the low cost mark for Braden Bristrow to 4,600, which is the high value as of this recording for Johnny Brito. Okay, so um, so last year's rookies that played for the first time in 2023. So what do you think, my question to you is, what do you think of these initial sales and do you see them holding value over time? Um, you know, usually we expect them to go down, but this is um, a special case I'm going to make an argument for that you know the MLB debut patch if it becomes a big thing this is the inaugural year for the patch so what do you think I think 95% of all the values will tank that's what I really <laughs> okay. think <laughs> all right. and, and, and it's all dependent on the the maybe even more like 99% it, it all depends on the 1% on how well they sure. become and perform right because you could have this whole class pan out to be nobody True. <laughs> right. So if, if that's the case, then I'm sorry, but it's it's not looking good. Right. It's like an IPO of a stock where, you know, you got the hype by day two. You know, it's retracted 50 percent. And, you know, by by the end of it, it it's irrelevant. Right. So um, that's the way I kind of see these MLB. Deb- I love them. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I was waiting for something like this. But mm-hmm. this is the problem with initial hype. Um, artificial inflation of value. So it's like we use that as a $2,000 buffer. We're saying that MLB debut cards are no cheaper than the one of ones are no cheaper than the $2,000 sale that that happened. But in reality, it's like, who's going to, are you going to pay $2,000 for that? I could name 50 right. other cards that I'd rather have than that particular no. I wouldn't say no name, but like it's someone not like a Volpe or a Jordan Walker, right? And yeah. That's the only issue I have with these is that there's a lot of hype around them. So I think it'll be a, definitely a cool collector piece. And I get it. The argument on the other side is this is the greatest you know, thing. Where else can you get a piece of history? That's given. Like We're only saying that if we had a Derek Jeter one of one uh, mm-hmm, top right. debut. But you're going to have to wait 20 years for that to actually be like, wow, this is the Anthony Volpe, given that Volpe has that kind of career. And that's even de- debatable, right? So it's tough for me to um, commit to this. I love mm-hmm. the card as a hobby or as a hobby perspective of the scarcity, the rarity, the looks of it, you know, the whole idea I love. I just don't think the artificial values are necessarily true value, we'll say. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's kind of like my take on that. <laughs> <laughs> I love how quick you are to respond. 95% are going to tank in value. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. That's what I feel. It's like <laughs> I mean, it's funny because I, I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> like the only chance you're going to make money off this is if you get one of those lore and prospects that go off. Right. Right? Because you're certainly not going to get your money. Well, I shouldn't say certainly not, but the Volpe is already at 150K, right? Yeah. Which is the manufactured... Exactly value that we're talking about and the jordan walker which would be number two probably is 100k right you know and so and it's a bounty so you, the the who's giving that out david adams i can't remember oh which. uh the it will, i'm not sure what the with the debut 
who okay. the bounty was. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's not even going to go to like a loan collector, right? It's going to yeah. be owned by a breaker or a store. Um, I can't remember who, but yeah. So there, you know, in that you're not going to get your ROI um, as a collector, but um, yeah, David 2000 Adams. Is, it's David Adams, David Adams yeah, for that yeah. one, right? Yeah, okay. So, um, so you you know you're hoping to pull essentially one or buy it as a single of one of these cards at uh, two thousand. Like that's hefty for you know a prospect, right? And I, I I do think the like you the card looks really nice, and I hope this is an annual thing, and maybe over time it'll become a big thing. Right. And I and but you know like I think there's so much hype because it's the inaugural year that I think you got to be careful. Right. Okay, so. That being said, I had just thought of a question um, based on what we talked about in our last episode, right? Jackson Churio, his MLB debut patch, went, like a real top prospect. I'm not saying Volpe isn't. I'm not saying Walker isn't. But right. like some guy like Churio that already has hype, you know, his Bowman Chromes are inflated because of the hype. 150K bounty, you pull it. Are you selling it? I'm selling it for sure. Okay. <laughs> not even a question. Churio, the guy you really like. Churio. MLB we're not, Davey Patch, he just said $150,000. Not even like $50,000. $150,000. Sold. Sold to okay. David Adams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, about, how about if it was 50 k 50 k Oh, man. It's a lot. It, it, it's still a lot of money. Um, yeah, I just... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I, I might take take the risk there just because that Ooh. card might be worth more. Like, you know, that might be a hundred thousand dollar card. Who knows, right? So it's like for me, I could still sell it for fifty. I, I feel right where there would be okay. enough buyers, right? And they, think about it: if Acuna had a one of one debut, how much would that be worth today? Oh, jeez. Well, his super fractor Bowman Chrome only sold for four hundred fifty thousand. Mm, okay. It's a good perspective. Yeah. So, so just put it put it out there. Do you value Bowman Chrome uh, Super Fractors higher than a rookie debut patch? Right. Right. And for me, it's like it goes back to the history of Bowman Chrome. And John mentioned it earlier that this mm-hmm. is Acuna's card when he was 17 years old, 16 years old. Nobody knew about. He has a nice auto on it on his Bowman 2017 Bowman Chrome. So it's like that. That has a lot more history and story behind it than yeah. the one of one debut patch right so yeah i'm not completely sold like i said i love the card i love the idea i just don't necessarily agree with the the hyped up values so no mm-hmm. if 150k was on the table i'm selling jackson churio sorry okay <laughs> uh, for the record i'm selling at 50k too so uh, <laughs> i'll take the money and run um yeah and and we did uh or john did that as a pick one in a previous episode and i put that on instagram um cut it i cut it up so so that it was a reel and some of the comments that i've got from that reel the majority are choosing super fractor over mlb debut so there you go that's kind of short small sample size that's kind of the feeling amongst the the baseball card collectors out there don't disagree okay (sighs) all right um I think I mentioned this in the last episode as well, but I did buy a hobby box of Topps Chrome Update. I was a sucker for the bounty. Nice. Um, what I did pull, I didn't pull a MLB Davy patch, but I did pull a Oswaldo Cabrera Refractor nice. Auto number to four ninety nine. Yeah, that's a nice card. Wrong Yankee. Wrong you know, I was Yankee. hoping for the Volpe. Yeah. But uh, you know, uh, things could have been worse. Like I said in our friend based uh, friend sports card chat group. Um, all right. So for our Friday topic today, I thought it would be fun to ask you, Hyung, about your baseball stories and the players you've met along the way, including the unicorn himself, Shohei Otani. Mm-hmm. If you're a loyal listener to the pod, you'll have heard bits and pieces of Hyung's story, playing in the system himself and what that experience was like. And I personally always like hearing about some of the players uh, Hyung competed against and got to see up close when there are some were just teenagers, um, you know, getting insight in how they were as a much younger player. And um, of course, several of them are now in the bigs. So if you don't mind, Hyung, I wonder if you can just touch upon a few of those players. And then I'm curious if you have any of their cards, bringing it back to the <laughs> hobby standpoint, and uh, what you think 
um, their full potential as having seen them um, at a much younger age. So, um, so for for I guess for those that don't know, I was fortunate enough to you know uh, have a baseball back. I played professional baseball, minor league baseball, and then yeah. um, you know I was playing up until 2013. Uh, and just organized uh, kind of like a semi-pro professional league. So I played uh, like 13 years between college pro baseball. And during that time, I got asked to coach uh, the 18 under national team for, for Canada. Um, I was a player on, on the 18 U national team back in 1999 and 2000. So uh, 2010, I started coaching um, that team and I've been doing it for 12 years. So I got to see a lot of players that we played international baseball. And one of them, yeah. uh, one of my first world championships where we actually won a silver medal. We lost to the Team USA in, in the gold medal game that year, but we opened up against a young Shohei Otani. So we, we, he was, I remember his scouting report was like 97 to 99 with a, with a, a 91 mile an hour split and then a really good slider. So, uh, yeah, our kids are, you know, and the crazy part about that team Japan was he was actually not their best pitcher. Uh, there was wow. a guy and you guys might know him because he's, he's in the big leagues right now. Shintaro Fujinami. He was kind of like the favorite uh, in terms mm. of the pitching side. Otani was a two-way player, so he could always hit. Uh, but uh, Fujinami was kind of like the hyped prospect, which he was the first pick overall in the uh, in the Japanese league, and uh, I, I believe Otani was too. So uh, seeing Otani, he started against us. He came out four-two uh, ball game, four-two um, uh, ball game in the seventh, and then we ended up uh, tying it in the ninth off this lefty reliever they brought. I don't know why uh, they replaced him, but Shohei was unbelievable, and we hit a two-run bomb, and then we went into extra innings. It was Jesse Hodges. He was a prospect in the Chicago Cubs organization. He hit a bomb that tied the game, and then we ended up uh, walking them off, and that game got us actually into the gold medal game, that first game, because it was the, wow. the way the format was is your records carry over in the super rounds, so yeah, yeah, we we ended up uh, winning a silver medal there. So I got to see Ot a young Otani pitch. So I remember after I seen him, I'm like, I look at my previous Facebook posts. I'm like, this guy is the next best thing, and nobody knew about <laughs> him. And I, every year I would write about him, and then he would hit the that home run at the Tokyo Dome in in 2016 oh, yeah. or whatever. And then I was like, I'm telling you, this guy's the next guy. This guy needs to be in the big leagues. Uh, but um, part more recently. Um, Team USA has always been loaded. And I was actually talking about um, this with somebody actually recent. That 2017, uh, we actually, uh, it was in Thunder Bay, uh, Canada. So we are hosting the World Championships. And we uh, lost in the bronze medal game, uh, but which was a really good finish for us, fourth place finish. We had guys like Edward Julian, who's the second baseman for the Twins, Bo yeah. Naylor, uh, who's catcher for Cleveland, Denzel Clark, who's going to be up with Las Vegas, I guess now. Um, mm. And uh, on Team USA, they had Alec Thomas, Tristan Cassis, Jared Kalanick, Nolan Gorman, Matthew <laughs> Libatori, Bryce Terang. I mean, Kumar Rocker started against us. So, uh, And then 2018, you had guys like Corbin Carroll, CJ Abrams, you know, Pete Crow Armstrong, Bobby Witt Jr., Anthony Volpe, <laughs> Dylan <laughs> Cruz. So Dylan okay. Cruz was one of the guys that didn't go professional out of high school. He went to LSU and then, you know, so he was on that, on that squad. And then, uh, more recently we we're in, we we're in Korea again in 2019. Um, and Japan had Roki Sasaki. Um, he's, he's probably one of the best pitchers, um, in the world. I'd say he's, he was Japan's ace. Uh, he's going to have a massive, massive contract. I think, uh, eventually, he was out in Korea um, on USA. They had guys like Mick Abel, Tyler Soderstrom, you know, uh, PCA. Uh, so, yeah, it's just um, incredible experiences against, you know, all these guys that, you know, I have a little insight, I guess, uh, seeing them uh, earlier in high school, see how good they were, what type of player they are, how they competed. And obviously, you know, they're, they're young, so you can't really make a conclusion yet, but Guys like right. Bobby Witt Jr. I knew that guy. Him and Volpe were 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 special, 
right? So mm. uh, guys like that, I have a, a bias too because I've seen them play. I know what they're about and what um, what I guess their ceiling is because we we deal with a lot of scouts in in the baseball world, especially when it comes to eighteen under. You know, uh, everyday scouts are talking. Uh, scout language of what what they what we see in in them as a player how they are as people so we're constantly yeah. giving feedback um you know and also you know always uh evaluating players right so i've i've done this for the last you know 13 years or so where i'm just evaluating players on my projections of you know what type of player they are what kind of future he has what tools can play with certain you know, organizations, for instance, uh, what they value more than others, you know, there's, there's so many th- different variables that come to scouting at the end of the yeah, day, but for sure. yeah. No, that's, I mean, th- you said a lot of big names, it's like a lot of young guys still, right. That are in the bigs, but it's crazy that you've like known or been able to see them, um, just kind of come up in the system and, and, um, you know, a follow-up question is, other than Shohei, which, you know, obviously he's become what he's become, um, and you did mention Bobby Wood Jr. and Anthony Volpe, who I had on the list, but is there anyone else um, that maybe hasn't, and even Corbin Carroll, but is there anyone else that you've seen um, that, you know, next year you're, you're going to start hearing about this guy? Dylan Any, Cruz. Anyone that comes to <laughs> Dylan Cruz, <laughs> yeah. the Nationals prospect? Yeah, okay. yeah, Dylan Cruz, that guy can absolutely flat out rake. I think he's going to be someone special. He was in the same category as the, the, the Witt Jr. The difference is, you know, he went to LSU versus, you know, uh, playing in the minors, right? So right. if you look at the development, they're kind of on the same path where he could be an impact player in the big league level. So that's, mm-hmm. uh, that's someone that – and interesting – uh, with Dylan Cruz from a hobby perspective is he has a exclusive I, I don't know the details but an exclusive um, uh, signing with Panini so this oh, co- this also causes I think issues I don't know how Bowman's going to roll out but usually Bowman draft uh, Dylan Cruz was the number two pick overall so he's not even in 2023 Bowman draft uh, I believe okay. Bowman Draft is releasing in in a couple weeks or three weeks, um, but he's not yeah. in there. There's rumors that he's going to be in 2024 Bowman. I don't know about the autograph, the whole autograph deal. What the if it's exclusive or not? There's not meant much detail out there because obviously Panini had collegiate deals and he came from that side of of things. So it's right. going to be interesting to see uh, from a hobby perspective um, what the chases with Dylan Cruz in terms of Bowman Chrome. I didn't know that. Yeah. I did a quick eBay search and all I could find is his 2022 Panini USA stars and stripes. Yes. Yeah. Well, he, his even, even, well, he was a, uh, this, this year's draft. So all the 2023 draft guys like Max Clark, Paul Skeens, you know, White Langford, they're all, they're going to be in Bowman draft this year, which is a really good class. Um, yeah. If Dylan Cruz was on it, then it would be, it, it would be even more crazier. But, I think the way Bowman does the allocation is they take like the number one and three pick overall and put them in the 2023 Bowman draft. And then they take the number two and four or two and five or whatever it is and put them in the 2024 Bowman so that there's an even distribution of uh, prospects. Okay. I see. You know, having seen some of these guys, like, do you look for their rookie auto cards early? You know, like before, and yeah. and you know what? It, it is hard. Uh, that being said, it is hard to like be early with Bobby Witt and Volpe because they get they have hype. They have too much hype. So yeah, up. yeah. That's the that's the but, issue. Is usually with these guys, I would I would target Bowman Chrome first because usually I've that that's you, you don't wait for them to be in the big leagues. You're kind of like, hey, I seen this right. guy when when his Bowman Chrome comes out, I'm gonna be on him. But by then, because they're such high profile players, they get. The, the it's overhyped right so they mm, get true the prices are astronomical we've seen it with you know guys like bobby witt jr in the 2020 class with with uh, jason dominguez all those guys they were just way overhyped at the time and the price only could go down no matter what bobby witt jr had a 30 30 season this year you know as a 22 year old and you know he's still he's still gonna be overpriced and the hobby has been seeing that where you know, if you bought Bobby Witt in the last two, three years, 
is very difficult to 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 create a profit, right? So there is that where it kind of goes against you, um, and it goes hand in hand with like if if they're a big time prospect, most likely they're gonna be hyped, right? Their their prices are gonna be overvalued just because everybody's doing the same thing. They get the same yeah. list as you, so it really doesn't play an advantage. I will say maybe in um, kind of like the international scene because we do travel a lot, you know, to the Dominican Republic and places where we go to the Dominican Academy and these kids are 16, 17 years old, um, where we get a good, you know, um, insight. Like I seen Vladdy when he was in like in 2016, for instance, where it's, it's super young, right? Where he, he was super young and Boba Shet was in the same category where it's like, oh, these guys are going to be legit. But by the time, right. you know, their Bowman Chrome comes out, it's like, you know, people are on them, right? So, um, and Boba Shet's a perfect example. Look at, look at his Bowman Chrome prices. You know, they're, yeah. they're, they're so low and that's the type of player he is in the big league. So caution with, with prospecting, the reality yes. is there's there's two or three different cycles between yeah. someone who signs a professional contract when he's 16 17 to basically when he gets gets to the big leagues and then after that it's another cycle so yeah no good good perspective good point and um you know like i think i wonder if things will kind of adjust a little bit more over time because everything right now in in the hobby at least 2021, 22 are anomalies where everything was so hyper inflated right. because of the the pandemic and just um, the interest in the hobby. And now things we're obviously seeing things kind of settle down. Do you think there'll be a point where it's like, okay, now it's not, you know, you'll definitely have the top prospects still be um, hyped and 100%. the values will be inflated. I think, right? I think, I think the, the way the hobby is, especially with prospect, I, I, I hear this a lot with a lot of people. How could you justify spending thousands of dollars on prospects and rip this? They're not even in the big leagues yet. You're, yeah. you're, 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 you're doing the wrong comparison. It has nothing to do with whether, you know, uh, Derek Jeter's prices on his rookie cards comparing it to a prospect because right. they're two different marketplaces. And the quicker you could separate the two, even rookie cards in general, like a Volpe rookie card will never fetch a Bowman Chrome you know, a uh, Volpe, for instance, right? So it's yeah. like stuff like that where, yeah, it's um, prospecting is a whole totally different game. And I get it. If you ask most collectors in the prospecting game, I guarantee you they will make more money or their ROI is better in prospecting than it would be a, just a standard collecting uh, type because you have the volatility, you have a weaker minor league system compared to the MLB. So these top prospects are supposed to perform. And when they do, you get that hype, right? So that's what you're 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 basically jumping on. And because these prospects are getting pulled in Bowman uh, and Bowman Chrome and Bowman Draft, there's enormous amounts of hype around these products because of it, right? So I think it's a marriage, uh, a perfect marriage for something like this, where I really enjoy prospecting. I enjoy watching minor leaguers excel through what they're supposed to do. I enjoy, you know, people that are in Bowman that have no business playing. And then all of a sudden, you know, you buy in for cheap and then they become a huge prospect. And then your ability to make, you know, ROI on, you know, no name people that end up, you know, cra cracking the list or end up making the big leagues. There's a lot, a lot of opportunity, right? So I think yep. if there was no Bowman Chrome in the hobby, it wouldn't be as fun. Like, yeah. this is what makes the Agreed. baseball hobby fun, right? So, um, yeah, I, I, I love every bit of the way baseball is. And you're right. It doesn't make sense. If, if, <laughs> if we were to say, okay, you got to cash out on every single card you have right now, of yeah. course, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> right. But that's the whole point of a marketplace. The marketplace will exist next year and the year after that. And there's cycles where these volatility happens, right? So it's like using a, a macro logic you know, in, in a 20 year cycle and trying to implement it into, you know, months, a, a, a marketplace that's, you know, going by right. months. Right. So, yeah, I hear you. I, I love how this conversation turned into Bowman Chrome prospecting <laughs> <laughs> from, from uh, your personal experience in baseball. But I love it because yeah. that's what got me back into the hobby. 
Bowman Chrome prospects and just guessing. And, and you know, like um, I've given up on like the top five prospects, like buying their cards, because as we just mentioned uh, multiple times in this show, it's going to be inflated. So I right. know I'm not going to get a good ROI or it's, it's, it's risky at least, right, right? right? So I always like to look, my strategy, I always like to look at 10 to 15, that mm-hmm. ranking, because I feel like, you know, they're obviously top 15 prospect and they can make the jump. If they make the jump, then usually their c- cards are more reasonably priced for um, for who they are as prospects. Right, right. And you know, like if I look at 10 to 15 right now, I'll list them out to you and you're going to hear names where like, wow, these are like good prospects and a lot cheaper than guys like Jackson Holiday, Jackson Churio, Paul Skeens, Dylan Cruz, and Ethan Salas, who are the top five. Right. right, so you compare that top five to ten to fifteen, which is ten. Jordan Lawler, eleven. Marcelo Mayer, twelve. Right. Pete Crow Armstrong, thirteen. Wyatt Langford, and fourteen. Colton Kowser. Right, you know what right. I mean? Like these are top. Pro- and I was just like for fun looked at uh, Pete Crow Arm- Armstrong's uh, Bowman Chrome twenty twenty Bowman Chrome first auto. His blue PSA ten is going for nine ninety nine. Yeah. yeah. Imagine a blue Jackson holiday. No, no chance. For, yeah. You're playing thousands. thousands. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So if you want, it's, it's, it's risky, but it's fun to play because you can make these short term flips 100%. in season on these lower, I don't want to say lower end prospects, but out of the top 10, even where right. you're like, you know, PCA. Yeah. I could see him totally make the jump. Yeah. And I, I think, I think um, the way, and this was probably accidental. It's just the way the marketplace is, is, like I like the top ten. I like that they're overpriced because think if if we're out there, you know, ripping Bowman draft now, and you spend you know five hundred bucks on a box and you rip, you get a Jackson Holiday like orange or red, right? Like you're like thank God there's a top hundred prospect in the top ten, like because that's that's your cash out where you're 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 basically taking taking the profit and then you know you know, playing that game, right? So there yeah. is both sides to it where, you know, as a, if you're buying singles or, um, you know, you're probably doing what you're doing where you're strategically buying in on guys that you think can crack that top 10 list and maybe they're not there yet. And yeah. on the flip side where if you're ripping, you're, you're, you're banking on hitting a top 10 prospect because, you know, the ROI is, is, is pretty good. Right. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'm going to bring this back to our original conversation of your <laughs> experience playing with um, a lot of uh, well-known baseball players. And, uh, you know, I wanted to save this guy for last because I believe you probably know him better than the ones we just mentioned. His name is Joey Votto, fellow oh, yeah. Canadian, um, social media personality now, uh, MLB veteran, of course. And we don't know where he's going to play next. It's definitely not the Reds. But um, what can you say about Mr. Votto and... Um, you know, we talked about this in our last episode. You know, um, uh, do you think Votto can eventually make it into the Hall of Fame? I believe Joey Votto is a Hall of Famer. Yes, I believe that he might not be like the first ballot, but um, I think he deserves it. I think in his peak, he he's kind of. I would say Juan Soto is more more like Joey Votto than any than hmm. than anybody. Because if you look at plate discipline, uh, the on-base right. percentage, you know, the His awareness OBP. of strikes on. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, but I would say even Votto is probably, um, I wouldn't even say a better hitter, like in terms of a true hitter, because Soto is that good. Uh, but yeah, a 300 hitter career, you know, you're going to see 20 to 30 home runs a year, uh, 100 plus RBIs um, on a season. You know, and Votto as a player, honestly, the craziest thing, he was drafted as a catcher. And so I've, I've known Votto since wow, I want to okay. say 1999, 1998. He got cut from the Ontario youth team. So we, we have, it would be equivalent to the state team in, in the U.S. So uh, we had Team Ontario where, you know, he wasn't even, cons- like he got cut from that. Uh, junior national team, he wasn't there. Rich Harden right. and Joey Votto didn't make it. Joey Votto was uh, selected in the second round as a catcher. Okay, nobody was on this guy except for this guy Bob Smythe, the local Etobicoke guy. He was scouting for the Cincinnati Reds, and yeah, uh, basically uh, took Votto in second round. And at that time, I think it was two thousand two or two thousand one. Um, 
he signed they call it slot money at the time like slot money for a second round is a million plus now but i think vado signed for maybe 300k 400 so it's a very cheap sign in the second round but nobody even had him in the probably top five rounds but here's Mm. cincinnati catching or uh um, signing him as a catcher so i remember vado i i was i didn't get close with vado until he started playing minor league baseball because um, we were both local kids. He, we knew about each other regardless because of the small community in baseball here. And he was a good player. He, he can hit, but he thought he was a better catcher than he was, right? That was, mm. I think his downfall is like, he would not move from that position. And, um, and Vado was basically, um, I got really close to him when we started playing minor league baseball because I was playing on Wisconsin. So I I was playing for the Timber Rattlers, Appleton, Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin Timber Rattlers in the Midwest League. So it it would be low A. I don't know if they're high A now, but I think they're high A. Uh, But And he played in Dayton. Dayton is the best place to play. If you're, if especially in in minor league baseball and A ball, you don't get the environment with thousands of people. You're usually playing in an empty stadium, traveling hours and hours. Sure. And the bus trips sucked. So I got really close with Votto because we were the only Canadian kids. So we would drive 14 hours or 12 hours to Dayton from Appleton, Wisconsin. We'd take our bus and then we'd, uh, we'd hang out because. You know, he would take me around in Dayton. So we started getting closer there. And then when we were back home in Toronto, we had trained in the off season. And then we both uh, basically made Team Canada in 2005. Uh, we were playing in in Amsterdam, in Holland, uh, for the World Championships. So uh, that's when he started getting really, really good, where he was putting right. up numbers in the minors. And I remember we were playing against Team Korea and... You know, Votto hit two bombs uh, off of Team Korea. One, it was an oppo bomb, and he pulled one like 420 feet. And the manager was like, who is this guy? Like they, <laughs> And on the spot, he was in the minor leagues. They offered him a massive, massive deal where they're like, come play in Korea. And Votto, Votto was so sure of himself. Like this guy, if there was someone with confidence, man, Joey Votto had it. <laughs> He yeah. was, he was, he just like shrugged it off. Like if, if you got a like 300 K offer to play in Korea and you're just like, meh, I'm going to make that in like a day, you know? <laughs> so it's like, that was the type yeah. of mindset Joey Votto had. And mm. this guy, I'm telling you, most guys will say he is the weirdest dude on the planet. <laughs> and this was back yeah. then. Remember, he's very different now. I think he's coming out of his shell now yeah. and but he's always had that personality. I think before people people didn't understand him. So he was a guy that I would say didn't have many friends mm. growing up. So it, it was like um, I was really close with him. Like we 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 did some stuff in Amsterdam um, that was legal in Amsterdam. I'll say, but crazy crazy <laughs> stories that I'm not going to talk about here. But um, yeah, he he was a guy that uh, like he would show up with corn rolls to team canada camp in overalls in overalls with a big chain you know those skater chains that you tie your wallet to your your belt loop or whatever so yeah he would show up in corn rolls with overalls with a skater chain and then just and even guys like morneau justin morneau like the older guys on they'd be like who who, who is this guy like and then he'd show up and it's like bomb 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 they're like Good lord, this guy can hit. But yeah, v- yeah, Votto. Yeah. If, if if I could sum up Votto is character. Mm. He's such a character, and you see it now. It's it's starting to come out. That's For that's sure. who he is. That's who he always was. You yeah. know. Um, and I remember when when he signed that big contract, he would uh, he'd be like, "Yeah, I'm in you know Fort Lauderdale. Um, I'm going to like Jay Z and Beyonce's party or some stupid stuff like that, where I'm just like, what the heck? Like he's just living life here. So yeah, yeah Votto's oh, a special man. character. I I I I hope that you know he he ends up in the Hall of Fame. He he totally deserves it. But yeah, he's he was he was one of my closest buddies uh, when I was playing minor league baseball for sure. Love that story. I love it. And um, yeah, definitely Votto is a character. And if he's if he's not a lock for Hall of Fame, he's definitely a lock for future broadcaster. He said, oh, yeah. I think he's he already, you know, once he's once he's uh, retired from the game of baseball, he's 
Yeah, he's. Um, I'm sure ha- we'll have many offers from different uh, TV organizations to come join their broadcast team. Um, but yeah, see, this is why this is why I love talking about Hyung. You know, a lot of the off-air stuff that you guys don't hear. Um, we sometimes just ask him about what it was like to play in baseball, and and that's the value Hyung brings to our podcast too. So, um, actually, this is a good segue because I love marrying baseball talk with baseball cards. Um, obviously goes hand in hand nicely and if you're a fan of baseball and particularly hearing from those who have been in the system like Kyung you should definitely listen to the Apo Taco podcast which we also produce I'll post a link below in the show notes so you can easily find it on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify it's hosted by former WBC Team Canada pitcher Chris Begg who we actually had on as a guest of our podcast here on Cards to the Moon, as well as Jason Willow, who we will have on the pod one day. We He's tried a card collector too, to, yeah. Card yeah. collector, lo- love that about him as well. And then, um, of course, former Minnesota twin Renee to Sony is, um, drops in and out of the podcast as well. So um, before we end this sh- episode, uh, you want to say anything about those guys? Oh, no, it, it, th- those guys are beauties. I love them. They're, they're my <laughs> brothers. So, you know, we're, we're all in this together. You know, Apple Taco is a brand I started back in 2009. So we, we kind of pivoted out of the apparel side and we're starting to do more content based stuff. So having those guys, uh, with their knowledge and especially them being card collectors, even yeah. Renee Tassoni, you got to have him on this podcast. He's not okay. a card collector, but he has a crazy card story because it involves his Bowman Chrome autos. So he had, he had one in 2009 or 2008, yeah. I want to say, or 2009. But there's a cra- crazy backstory on that. And he's not even a card collector. And then Beggar, <laughs> Beggar and Willow both uh, are huge card collectors. We talk yes. cards all the time. So, uh, they're, yeah, they're, they're good, good people, good, very good baseball guys. That And with the Oppo Taco podcast, believe it or not, I'm not on it. I've never been on it. <laughs> but I know, Clark, you produce right. it. So um, it's, it, it's really good. I listen to it, though. I, I listen to my own podcast where it's like, wow, this is really good. And I love, I love it because it gives insight on the more detailed stuff. So they would go have guests like, um, uh, Damiano Palmageni, who's, uh, who's an upcoming prospect for Toronto Blue Jays. They would have guys like that, Denzel Clark, That's cool. um, yeah. Dave McCabe, everybody from like the Arizona Fall League. Uh, so guys like, top prospects who have great baseball stories where it's more uh, uh, baseball culture and uh, uh, cater to kind of like uh, stuff that you wouldn't see in your generic ESPN or MLB, right? right? So it's yeah. a, it, yeah, definitely goes hand in hand with cards as well and yes. prospecting. So yeah. Yeah. So let's definitely listen to the Apple Taco podcast, listen to Cards to the Moon and, and uh, uh, you know, a uh, shout out to Jason and Rogan who, who really have taken the reins um um, since uh, the first episode as well and producing it so I want to give them a shout out and um, yeah it's it's um, we love those guys there too and, and uh, we'll definitely have those guys on the pod talk about cards because it's always a good time okay uh, let's end off this uh, Friday episode longer than usual but um, we'll have a brand new episode for you guys uh, on Tuesday see you then bye hey thanks for listening to Cards to the Moon We'd really appreciate you subscribing to our podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And you can also connect with each of us on Instagram at 5 Card Guys, or you can follow Hyung at Integrity Sports Cards, or John at Trade You at Recess. You can also check us out at 5CardGuys.com. Thanks again, and hope to connect soon.